So, Suds in the City. Basically, Stella gave me a title of how to incorporate water into your designs, and I decided, oh, no, no, better sex it up a bit. Um, so I decided to call it Suds in the City, and then I, after that I realised, oh, I don't really need to sex it up, because you guys are coming anyway. It's not like you're just coming to come and see something about water. You're coming for all the other talks as well, so I've de-sexed it back to how to incorporate water into your designs. Um, so, who am I who are, who are ECH2O? So, okay, so I'm Kath. Um, ECH2O, we're a small environmental consultancy. I head it up. Um, and really, the main things is we're environmental consultants providing technological and behavioural solutions that reduce the UK's carbon footprint. Uh, my background is I used to be in plumbing. So, we work with different sorts of clients, sometimes individuals, sometimes small architecture practices because they're good at... Um, uh, building envelope, less good at um, uh, the services. Um, but also we work a lot with schools. We work a lot with um, kids in schools, which is great, which is really good fun. Um, so what am I going to talk about? So yes, how to incorporate water into design, why you should, options available, and some other stuff. Because I suddenly thought, do you know what, I do want to just cover everything about water in my half an hour. Uh, if you want to see that stand-up gig, just Google my name and YouTube and you'll see it. Um, I'm not going to tell you why engineers hate plumbers, but it's very, very unfair. I used to be a plumber for many years and I was doing the stand-up gig in an audience, amongst an audience of engineers. Um, and why you guys were still discharging raw sewage in the sea until October 2013. You aren't anymore, but that was what your poo was doing right up until then as it went out to out on the tide, back in onto the beach. Okay, so I just think it's really important to get water into, into cities and into all your designs. So whether you're, you know, happen to be designing a whole city, which I doubt any of you are, but you're designing um, uh, your own individual house or, you want, or your property and you want to make it more sustainable in terms of water, Start to move the water around, start to have the water above ground, not, none of this sort of putting it underground, which is what we always used to do with water. And I just think these are two lovely images. So I was in Carcassonne last summer um, and in the old city and there was just that, which is how they just would divert all their rainwater down um, so that even when it was raining really hard, you could walk on the outsides and wouldn't, wouldn't get wet. And this one on the right, you can see I didn't take that photo, I just stole it from the website. Um, and um, that's just, you know, a really new development near City Hall um, and just putting water in and that water is, is just moving. Just getting water and greenery in, into the city. And when I'm talking about Suds, Suds does get greenery in as well. Um, first of all, I just want to talk about the carbon load of water a bit. I'm not going to go too much into this, but I just want you to understand that cold water has a carbon load because we've had to take that water either from rivers or from uh, groundwater sources. We've had to clean it. Once we've used it in our buildings, we then have to take it away and we have to clean it again before we put it back into the environment. That has a carbon load because we mostly use electrical energy to do that. Um, it's 0 0.7 kilograms of CO2 emissions per cubic metre, which is 1,000 litre of mains water used. Um, but as soon as we start to heat that water, unless we're using um, solar thermal or, say, biomass, which has a, a very low carbon footprint, we'll start to really increase that, that carbon footprint. So actually, it's the hot water use, really, if we're going to look at issues of the overall sustainability of water that we use in our buildings, you really, really have to concentrate on, on your hot water use. And in my bag, but unfortunately not in my pocket, I do have, that's very annoying, um, the little four-minute shower timer that all the water companies are sort of giving away, try and get you all to spend four minutes in the shower. And I spend a lot of time chatting to school kids about that, which is fine when they're like 10 and under harder when they're adolescents and I'm trying to say, hey, four minutes in the shower. Um, uh, so if you're looking at water efficiency solutions, and we're not looking at behaviour now, we're just looking at bits of kits, dual flush WC, flow regulations, automatic taps. If it's a school or an office you're, you're designing, then you can start looking at urinal use. So you can either go waterless urinals or controlled urinals. Um, 
If you're just looking back into how you group the pipework, I'd say close grouping of appliances to your boiler or your hot water cylinder. And um, if you do put solar thermal up, if you use solar thermal, um, or even if you're heating your hot water by gas, then if we look at the overall carbon footprint, it makes sense to hot fill a dishwasher because all dishwashers now are cold fill and they heat the water up from sort of 10 degrees C incoming temperature, even to an eco cycle, they heat it to about 45 to, to 50. Whereas at least if you put it in hot water from your, either from your solar thermal or from your gas boiler, then you're not using electricity, which is much more carbon intensive fuel to heat it up. And all those solutions on, on the left are going to give you large water and or CO2 savings. They're all low cost. You're going to have to have a toilet, so you may as well have a dual flush toilet. You've got to have taps, you may as well have flow regulation in your taps. You've got to have a shower, you may as well have flow regulation in your showers, etc., etc. Fast payback, simple to install. You've got to install a toilet anyway. It doesn't make any difference whether you're installing a dual flush one or a single flush one. Little required maintenance, you've got to maintain a single flush loo, you've got to maintain a dual flush loo, etc., etc. Um, and I say that because very often what happens is when people think sustainable water use, they go, oh yeah, rainwater harvesting, grey water recycling. So A, I don't think grey water recycling has, has a role really at the moment in, in the UK for various reasons. I'm going to talk about uh, wastewater heat recovery from grey water. Rainwater has, has solutions somewhere, but I would prefer to keep rainwater outside and use it like, like that, outside. Um, and I'll talk about that as well later on. Um, but rainwater is not... Um, it'll result in large water savings if you use it inside the building. It's not low cost. It's not simple install. It requires maintenance. Um, Hot water. So if we look at somewhere I've got a little red button, but I can't now remember where it is. OK, so is that it? Yeah. So if we look at the UK compared to southern Spain, you know, Greece, Italy, yeah, it doesn't have that much um, solar irradiation, but it's still got enough to give us solar thermal. We can get um, enough hot water for a family of four. We can get enough hot water for a family of six to heat our hot water, to get about 50% of our hot water through the year by using solar thermal. Um, in the summer months, we'll get most of the hot water, as long as we size it correctly. In the winter months, we'll sort of preheat. We'll be able to preheat, obviously. We can get um, PVs as well. So if we just very, very quickly look at this in terms of solar thermal, why can't I see it? Yeah, OK. So you're going to have your collector on the roof. That can either be a flat plate collector or evacuated tubes, depending on the space. If you've got space, go for flat plate collectors. They can be roof integrated as well, just like a large Velux window. Um, come with their own flashing kits. You have a dual coil cylinder, solar rated, which just means it has more insulation on than a standard hot water cylinder. And then you have a temperature differential controller on the... On most systems, there are different types of solar systems. I haven't got time to go into all the different types. Um, but at its basic, this says useful heat to be collected because we've got more. This is our hottest part of the system, and this is our coldest part of the system. And when, there's, when this is 3 to 5 degrees C hotter than here, that means there's useful heat to be collected because the sun has heated up the water or the heat exchange fluid sitting in our panels. And the pump will come on and just very, very slowly take this through the panel back, it's now hot, and it will give up its heat into the hot water cylinder. Um, in the winter months, there won't be enough to heat your water fully in your cylinder, therefore you always have a backup boiler. If you're not connected to um, the gas mains, then you can just have a hot water, uh, you can just have an immersion heater in there. Um, it's just the writing, really, of, of what I said. You can use solar PV to heat, to heat hot water, this is now happening more and more on sites that are off the, the gas mains. So what, happen, what happens is you put PVs on the roof and um, a lot of the time in the day your PVs aren't required. There's just a little bit needed for the fridge or freezer and therefore normally that the electricity would be um, exported. What you can now do is you can now just switch it so it goes into a hot water cylinder and heats up your hot water cylinder and you're looking at £350 plus installation for the Emerson, which is just a little bit, it's just basically a box. 
here that just sits in between your inverter and your external mains, or your mains supplies there, um, versus £4,000 and up for solar thermal. Um, heat recovery from wastewater. You see, I think the useful thing about grey water or, or, or wastewater is the fact that it's got heat inside it. And there's kit now out on the market, cheap kit, kit with no working parts, kit that doesn't need to be maintained, that will take that waste heat and will put that back into your incoming water. It's called wastewater heat recovery. Um, it now costs less than £500 to buy, which is uh, the bottom one. And basically, this is how it works. So the water comes out of the top of your shower, 40 degrees C. By the time it's gone over your body and got down to the bottom of the shower tray or to the shower tray, still at 37 degrees C. That goes down, runs down to waste. Normally, that's 37 degrees C worth of water going out. You put wastewater heat recovery in, and the best ones to put in are vertical, um, and I'll explain why in a bit. Um, and they're quite tall, so you see two, they're about 1.8 metres tall, so they require about two, two to two and a half metres under the shower tray. And then your cold mains coming in, which comes in about 10 degrees C, by the time it's gone through the wastewater heat recovery, it comes out 27 degrees C. Now, your water now, in effect, your cold water going into the back of your shower is no longer just at 10 degrees C, it's 17 degrees C higher. Therefore, you need less hot water to heat your shower to design temperature. You can also continue that up and also put it into your boiler or your hot water cylinder. Um, uh, it comes from the Netherlands. It says here, tests have shown 62% of waste heat recovered with a flow rate of 7.5 litres a minute. What's great about that flow rate of 7.5 litres a minute is that every single uh, flow, flow regulated shower head for the domestic market is 7.6 litres a minute. So it works perfectly. You will get the, the maximum. That's how you get the maximum heat recovery. And if we just look at this, this is how it works. So when water goes down a vertical pipe, it actually adheres to the edge of the vertical pipe. So inside here, this internal water going down here, that's your grey water with 37 degrees C. Then you've got a very, very, very thin copper tube. And then you've got an outer copper tube. And in between those two copper tubes or copper walls is your um, incoming mains water going up. So you get very, very fast heat transfer be between the two. You can fit it to two showers, one of which could be an electric shower. I just think everybody should be putting those in. Easy if it's a new build. You've got to think about it more, obviously, if it's um, a retrofit, because quite often your shower will just be going straight into a stack and straight out of the, straight out of the wall. Um, right, what happens when it rains? So I want to talk about several different things here, about what happens when it rains. Um, but if we, oh, sorry about that, guys. If we, look at, if we look at this, when it rains in the sort of uh, non-urban area, we're getting evaporation, we're getting transpiration from the trees, we're getting a lot of infiltration, and we're getting a nice base flow underneath. And we're getting runoff, but only a small amount of runoff. And what happens is when, once we're in a city or, or a town, we're getting reduced infiltration because we've just got impermeable surfaces anywhere. We get increased runoff. That runoff is polluted. We get erosion of our, of our riverbed. We get a reduced base flow, which means that the health of our rivers isn't, isn't so good. We're getting reduced transpiration, reduced evaporation. So what we want to do is we want to green the city as much as possible. And I wasn't able to be here this morning, but I know you guys had someone here talking about rainwater, uh, sorry, uh, green walls and green roofs. So I'm hoping that they explained that as well and explained why that it was so useful. This is the other thing that happens when it rains. Now, not in all towns and cities, but in a lot of towns and cities, we have what we call combined sewers, especially in the older parts of, of the cities. And what happens with the combined sewers is the rainwater mix, mixes with um, foul water from, from our buildings. When it's not raining, our sewage treatment plant can cope with the amount of foul water that goes through it. But when it's raining, and I apologise for the uh, quality of that picture up here, but when it's raining, there isn't enough space in the sewage treatment plants. We have an overflow weir here, and we end up with untreated sewage going straight out into the river or the sea. And this is a plug. 
Um, so I said we did a lot of stuff with school kids. We do stuff around behaviour change. This is a book that I wrote and illustrated by a, a friend of mine called Mysterious Case of the Sinking Flamingo. And in it, this is Clarence the Crab explains to Frankie the Flamingo how he gets poo on his head. Um, and um, this little picture here on the right-hand side, this is by Putney Bridge in London. So when it rains in London, um, we get a huge amount of um, poo goes out into the... Uh, into the Thames, most of it floats down the middle, but then the currents bring it in into, into the sides. And that's what happens with every time it rains. Most uh, seasides will be happening on yours as well. I'm sure some of yours are still combined that you'll, you'll be getting uh, raw sewage going out to sea, even though most of it doesn't you know, now because you've upgraded it. So we want to decouple rainwater for combined sewers. And this is what I, I really talk about a lot when I'm sort of, and, and when I'm always working with um, different sorts of clients. Um, <coughs> how can you do that? Do something with the rainwater that falls on your building or, or, or near your building. Yes, there are end of pipe solutions. So the end of pipe solution in London is to build a super sewer. But there are loads and loads of front of pipe solutions. So at its simplest, you can just depave front gardens. Um, so I've put here alternatives, a gravel, permeable paving, reinforced grass areas, or just return to a garden. Um, and uh, this is looking out of my, my house to the right. So these guys have paved their front gardens, um, not even to park on, but just so that, you know, it's easier to keep them clean so that weeds don't grow. They're crazy paving there. Um, whereas ours is just gravel and, and um, planting. Uh, if you want to, if you've got a big driveway and you want to park off road, well, you can park on gravel. Gravel is permeable. Or you can get reinforced uh, plastic, which you then just put your grass over. Suds, which I'm going to talk about, or collect and use rainwater. Um, so what are suds? I won't worry about the top one. So they're basically systems, sustainable drainage systems that treat and dispose of stormwater to reduce pollution and local flooding um, and what's great about them is they provide biodiversity as well as controlling stormwater runoff and that's like the important thing to remember about suds so permeable paving and, and swales so what we're doing here is we're just saying okay the rainwater that falls on these parking areas or these or these areas we're not going to run that off into an underground um uh, into an un in the underground drainage. We're just going to let it infiltrate straight down. So you can see on this picture here, there's no road gullies, there's no gullies here. So all the rainwater that falls on there just infiltrates straight down. This is a build-up of a permeable, uh, permeable paving. So you've got a sand layer here on geotextile and then you've got um, gravel un underneath with a 30% void ratio. You're getting this more and more in, in city car parks. So, again, no road gullies. All the rainwater that falls on the car parks is just run and channeled into here. And then you've just got crates under here which collect the rainwater. And you've got a tree at the top. So the tree will just take the rainwater out for, for evapotranspiration. Um, swales are just ways of moving water around. So swales will usually take water from roofs and then rather than them just running underground, you will just put in, basically they are just grass-lined um, uh, ditches, shallow ditches, um, and they will move the water around. And again, you're just relying on infiltration normally to go down. The grass will also slow down the, the rate at, at which it goes. Um, suds basins and ponds. So a suds basin, top left-hand corner, only has uh, rainwater in it when it's rained. So we've got a bridge over here because when it's rained, that area is full of water and it just infiltrates down. Pipework is there coming in. That's on a very large development. It's actually in Berlin. Um, and so that rocks there are just to stop it getting eroded as the rainwater runs in. And that infiltrates straight down. These are all just examples from the UK of... Um, Suds ponds, so suds ponds always have water in, but the water level is sometimes higher and, and sometimes, sometimes lower. Um, I'll tell you a couple. What I would say about, as soon as you bring water into the environment, you get different plants, you get different bird species, you get different insects. 
um, all that you would not get in the absence of water. You also get different microclimate built up around water. So put as much above ground water as you can. If it's your own house, small house, just put a little, a little suds pond in. Um, this, this one here was one of the first suds ponds in the UK. Tiny little pond. This was actually in Hawley, so not far away from you guys. Um, and it was only in a big new development. It was only in front of about 20 of the houses. And they found it really difficult at that time. This is just early 2000s to sell these houses. Because people would go, oh, well, I don't know, there's a pond. What if little Johnny runs out and drowns in the pond? But there's a road here, you know, and no worries about little Johnny running into the road and um, getting knocked over by a car. And the other thing that's really interesting about suds is that for a long time, there was this concern about if you had housing with kids in and you put a suds pond in, um, that it was a danger. And on this particular site, this is in Northampton, they said that they required a fence. They didn't have a fence before. The council came along and said, no, 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 we need a fence. So I thought this was brilliant. So the architect said, all right, well, we'll put this fence on. And um, that ticked their box. I mean, you know, any kid worth their salt can come over that fence, obviously. And what I thought was actually uh, kids riding along on their bikes, BMX bikes, would just like leap over it, so it would actually make it more dangerous. But what's great is that as soon as you've got one in some areas, then someone else, another local authority, go, oh, yeah, OK, well, we're happy to have a, a suds pond and stuff. Rain gardens and rain garden planters. These are things that you can really simply fit into just individual houses. So all they are is they're saying what we're doing is we're just decoupling the rainwater downpipes from the drains. So we're no longer putting our rainwater into the drains when it falls. So, OK, you've got a water butt here, but the outlet from that water butt comes down just some little channel here, you know, sort of a casual little rill, into an area that's been dug out, sand and gravel has been put inside it, and then plants planted that don't mind sometimes having their roots inundated with water. And these are all types of plants that don't mind it. Uh, there's now a UK rain, uh, rain gardens guide for the UK, if you go onto that website. Um, that's a much more, this is a much more um, sort of stylized one. But basically, again, no yard gullies here. All the rainwater just runs out of here into that garden area. This is a rather fantastic example from the US. So this is their downpipe. So they just did this amazing downpipe, runs into a rain garden. And look at that, we've got fish coming up. Oh, and look at this. You see, now this is kind of weird. Because now, because I like been hurrying because of my little clock of doom, I've now got so much time left, I'm going to have to, like, start doing a stand-up gig. <laughs> could just fill in the time. <laughs> no, 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 it's, oh, I'm, I'm lying. I uh, have got some more slides. Uh, rainwater harvesting. So, in the UK, rainwater is classified as fit for purpose. WC flushing, washing machines, groundwatering, nothing else. So it's not considered clean enough to washing, let alone um, drink, drinking. Um, however, on the plus side, most, most buildings, um, and because of the lack of rain that we get in the UK, we don't have enough, you won't have enough rainwater for all the washing purposes as well. So you may as well just collect it, you, you filter it a bit, and I've got a slide coming, coming up, and then you can use it. And I'll, t I'll talk about a bit more about that in the next slide. Generally, it's better suited to larger buildings. So, again, if you've, um, that's above a house, so school, factory, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, a lot of rainwater harvesting in farms, just for washing down um, the cow sheds and things like that. If you're looking at retrofitting, it's difficult to retrofit for internal use. I'll explain that on the next one. So it's far easier to collect and use it outside. There are lots of different... Um, uh, solutions around. On the left hand side these are just called hogs and you can just slot them together um, and save your rainwater in there. You can get ones that you can um, store underground and this is just purely from outside so there's a little pump inside and then a hose connected to it so it's just for outside use. You can now get a lot of these tanks which are much much shallower tanks, they're like this so you don't have to do deep excavation which is really, really helpful. Um, they can, they all, and the tanks will come in all different sizes, but, you know, generally for sort of small house, you're looking 2,000 litres only. You don't want to oversize the, the storage. 
this is what the, the systems look like. So if we look at this one first, there's your filtration. So we do filter the water that comes off the roof, first of all, um, before, before we store it. You would normally have the pump sitting outside, inside the rainwater harvesting. This is one that's going back into a building. So we come back, ghost garden comes here to sort of outside use, just ground uh, washing use, washing machine and toilet. Um, not dishwasher but washing machine is fine. Tap here, tap here has to say not drinking on it because it's not for, not for, it's not classified for drinking. Um, you would still have an overflow that then runs down into the, into the mains. Whereas if you're collecting on um, back here and you're using this, this on the rain gardens, this all infiltrates down, so we don't ever put it into, into the main supply. We just allow it to just work outside in, in the grounds and evapotranspire. If you're building on a larger one, then you've got dual pump sets. This has even got triple pump set here. But again, washing machines, toilets. You can do use it for urinal flushing if it's in a building, schools. Um, pump, sorry, filtered. So here, here's our filter here. Um, this just stops all the rainwater, sort of the stuff at the bottom. You get a slight biofilm at the bottom being um, uh, sort of disturbed. And again, trapped overflow goes out to the drains. And um, all right, and this is my final slide. And this is my final slide, which now looks like another latent advert which it is sort of but um, sometimes you know you don't have to look for the most complicated solution and this is a this is a real solution so this was Bristol Zoo and a friend of mine who did rainwater he was asked to go to um, Bristol Zoo because they said oh we really want to do rainwater harvesting and they had in in mind the the system that was here this is what the the zoo had in mind that's what they thought they would do and he went there and he said, well, you know, it'd be, and they were bringing it off a building next to the flamingo pool. And he said, you know, it would make much more sense to actually just run it straight into the flamingo pool. Because you're constantly filling the flamingo pool up with rainwater. So why don't, why don't, you, why don't you do that? Um, and that's what they did. And that's why I ended up writing the book. OK, look at that. One minute, 47 seconds left. Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you very much indeed, Kath. Very, very inspiring. And now um, we have Sandy Halliday to talk about some pioneers and their examples. To give us some inspiring case studies. When Stella uh, very kindly um, invited me to come and talk at this event, come down from Edinburgh, and to talk about the architecture that responds to climate, I went, oh, wow, gosh, international politics, the socio-political climate. Oh, gosh, uh, it's all a bit heavy, really, isn't it? I mean, there's a few kind of low-impact developments, you know, actually responding to, to human need out there, but they're pretty rare, and, and basically housing is now just a branch of banking. Um, so, really, it's just a, you know, it's, it's a mess. Um, so, kind of, how do we respond to, to that climate? You know, it's, it's tough, isn't it? Um, and I think particularly after a day like today, um, I wonder um, why, with everything to gain, sustainable design is still marginalised. It's still countercultural. You know, we're doing good things, but we're not being mobbed. We know what to do. We've heard. We know what to do. We know, actually, quite a lot of how to do it. But somehow... It's not happening, and the consequence of that is that we are so less resilient than we might be. Shameful, really. So, um, I suggested, and Stella was quite amenable to this, that I would talk about Ecomax, and I would talk about ideas that have been prevalent in my lifetime, um, and eco-pioneers in my lifetime who have inspired me, 
in the fields of, let's say, social responsibility, community participation, conservation, ecology, sustainable economics, biodiversity, landscape, clean technology, green politics, and democracy. Should be able to get through that in the next 29 minutes. Um, anyway, I'm, a, I'm an engineer, and I fell amongst architects, I'm afraid. In 1995, I was working in building services in research into passive design and trying to design the services out of buildings. Uh, what became known as building physics. And I met with an architect, Howard Liddell, who was designing the building services engineer out of buildings. Brilliant. Genius. Uh, I fell in love, of course. Um, and we formed Gaia Group. Um, and Gaia Group involved my company, Gaia Research, in which we undertook design, which was Howard's uh, field of expertise, we evaluated as much we, as we could in order to learn from what we, we were doing. We then went on to disseminate and feed back what we were doing, heaps of publications and lectures, capacity building and training, which is what I do the majority of these days. And that, of course, led on to more research, because that's, that's what happens. And we actually broke away two or three times a year and went away to think about things that actually needed to be done, that we wanted to do, and preferably that somebody would pay us to do. Um, and we, we had a ball, actually, um, pursuing innovation and sustainable design. And that was it. That was actually the full agenda um, of what we did. Howard and I never failed to acknowledge the influence that, that we had on each other. We, we met in September 1995. Uh, we married five weeks later. Um, and we had this creative push you, pull me, uh, kind of edge to our work, which was this fabulous synergy of thoughts and ideas. And this lecture is very much a hybrid of that. Uh, when Howard died, he was working on um, eco-pioneers and great ideas, and I was working on the history of ideas, and this lecture brings those things together. Talking very much about a lot of unrepresented stuff um, in development. Within Gaia, sustainable development was always the three pillars of sustainable development. It's a Gadesian, it's a Geddes concept based on folk, folk, work and place. And what we were trying to get across was that if you don't deal with all of these things, the three-legged stool is not sustainable. It will fall down. Which is my opportunity to introduce my, my first um, eco-pioneer. He's the Scottish polymath, Patrick Geddes, he was an innovator in urban planning and sociology. Um, he said a lot about holism, but actually my favourite quote is a different one. My favourite quote is, by leaves we live, which is rather nice. Um, I think Geddes would have very much approved of, of work that we did at somewhere like Fairfield, which was a housing development. Um, and there, what we, what we did was we, we didn't just talk about the three aspects of sustainable development and how they work together, we actually implemented that to demonstrate that this actually really does synergize. So we looked at letting policy, maintenance, and placemaking, um, and we looked at minimizing pollutants as an environmental impact that we could actually introduce into these houses. Um, education, policy, and services are the typical things that you look at in terms of the social agenda, but what we created there was actually healthy housing. And when you're looking at the financial and economic aspects, poverty, rental income, and housing costs, what we were actually doing was showing that we could actually reduce the medication costs of the people living in the healthy housing, which, of course, then gives you the political will and the political influence to encourage people to perhaps make healthy housing a proper part of a respectable social housing agenda. Um, so I think Geddes would definitely have, have approved of that. Because this was a very divergent environment where we were exploring and seeking out new ideas and how to integrate those, we got more and more frustrated at the funneling of approaches to sustainable development. It, I think, became a very degraded term. 
Um, some time ago, I referred to children talk, uh, to people talking about sustainable development, like ten-year-olds talk about sex, a lot, um, but not with any great intelligence, not with any great inclination to ask anybody anything that might be useful to know about it. Um, we kind of decided that we would move away from this idea of sustainability. There is no silver bullet. It's not about eco-bling. It's not about the god of passive house. It has to be a holistic, integrated approach. Now, Howard's response to that was, was to write eco-minimalism, the antidote to eco-bling, which I recommend to you. Um, but that wasn't intended to be the final aspect. Um, there was another book to do, which was Ecomax. Um, my background has been a sort of life cycle approach to buildings, if you like. Worrying about the kind of housing that we're going to leave for Justin Bieber, um, or, yeah, or for Mick Jagger's grandchildren. Um, and I wrote this code of practice in 92. I wish more people had read it. Um, it was a life cycle approach for architects and engineers to look at the interventions they could make at various fee stages. That then became the Green Guide to the Architect's Job Book, um, which addressed architectural issues specifically in the same sort of way, adding in post-occupancy evaluation, refurbishment, demolition, uh, and reuse. Um, the intention was this would always become part of a formal architectural agenda, and in 2013-14, I was asked to write the Sustainability Guide to the RIBA Plan of Work, so I adapted the Green Guide to that. Very quickly, the plan of work is a very short document. It's, a, it's, it's basically a piece of A3 in which it tells you the things, the, the fee stages along the top and some interventions along the lines of town planning, um, project procurement, design leadership, etc. cetera. Um, they then wrote about an 80-page guide and then about a 200-page guide to this. And eventually, they procured a whole series of books of which there's only one which is optional. That's mine. <clears throat> which begs a number of questions, doesn't it? It's sort of, we are where we are. We are in this climate now. And for some reason, this huge number of people think that sustainable design is optional. I think it's irresponsible to take that approach, but then there, there you go. So I've gone back to talking about development because I don't think it's about how we do stuff. I think it's about why we do stuff. And that seems to be the bit that seems to be missing from a lot of education. Um, so very quickly, I'm going to go back to development. And I'm going to take you back to the Club of Rome in 1968, when a bunch of people got together to talk about things that they thought were important to all nations, but outweighed the ability of any individual nation to deal with. 1968. Recognize any of them? Um, it was a very optimistic time. We'd just gone through the Green Revolution. We'd had this massive increase in food production over a 10-year period from 51 to 61. And there was this very technological uh, optimism, which the assumption was if you put more demands on the Earth, then the Earth's ability to sustain you would increase. We just ask more of it, you know, because, because we're good that way. It'll just, it will respond to our needs. The Club of Rome did a little study and what they identified was that the investment in nitrates was 146%. Equipment spend was over 60%. And the pesticide use was 300%. And they kind of figured this was probably not sustainable. Um, you can sympathize with that, I think. And they also looked at the whole idea of exponential growth and recognise that there are very few, if any, examples of this within nature. Uh, what was more normal was that you would get a system which would grow against the background natural environment. It would, it would diminish that natural environment, and then it would fall away. So like mice and owls. You know, you have a really heavy winter, the mice stay under the snow, the owls can't get to the mice, so the owls fall away. The next winter, there's loads and loads and loads of mice, not many owls, and you get that oscillation, which is much more typical of natural systems. This reminds me 
of the first stage of when you're actually test testing the resilience of a system. Yeah? When you actually can, you put stresses and strains on, on a system and up to a certain point, actually, you can always get back to where you wanted to be. And it's called the elastic region. Yeah? Um, and that's very much this oscillation that's going on within the natural environment. We still have mice and owls, you know, over, over time. What the Club of Rome guys actually thought might be a problem was we got overshoot, that actually the stress put on the system would be so great that we would lose that ability to return to where we were before, which, oddly enough, in engineering terms, reminds me enormously of what we call the plastic region here, where when you start to put further pressure on the system, you can never get back to where you were before. You've gone past its yield point. And uh, sadly, um, after that, um, you go beyond that point even further, and it's broken. You don't actually know. In fact, in this form of destructive testing on a system, you have to break it in order to figure out when it's going to break. Be concerned, be very concerned. So the Club of Rome actually suggested that we should talk instead about the limits to growth. Um, they call for stewardship and the, to seek ways to stay within the limits of the earth so that we understood what those limits were and we didn't break through them. So we haven't actually done that yet, as far as I'm aware. There's a lot of research going on, isn't there? But we still don't know what the limits to growth are. There was a limits to growth report. Um, and, and it actually brings me on to good idea number two, which was from Schumacher as a result of the limits to growth. Um, Schumacher was a, was a very renowned statistician and economist, um, and I came across him through studying appropriate technology, technology at human scale. Um, the concerns that have been expressed by Schumacher haven't actually been dealt with. We've, we've gone on to exceed all our Require all of the predictions of what we would use. And the recent research said that, indeed, we have gone beyond the limits. It's gone. Um, Schumacher, however, was also an economist, worth remembering. So his concerns about growth were first and foremost about the economy. Uh, and just a little fact to ponder. If you'd invested one penny um, in one AD at 4% interest, you would have bought a ball of gold, the weight of the earth, by 1821. Um, oddly enough, by, by 1839, you'd have got two, because that's compound interest. That is the wrecking ball of compound interest. Uh, by 2003, you'd have had over 1,200 solid gold earths. It's good, isn't it? It's excellent. Um, every 17 years, doubling about every 17 years, which brings me to good idea number three, which is... And we know it, don't we? We know it. Growth economics is not sustainable. You know, sorry, I could get us all singing this, I think. I'm in that kind of mood. Uh, but these are things we know. We might have had to find them out because we were never taught them. But we've kind of found them out. Um, Schumacher would have also, I think, very much have appreciated my, appreciated my good idea number four which um, actually comes from the uh, incoming king of Bhutan as a 17-year-old. Uh, gross national happiness is, is more important than gross national product. We know it again. Um, there is an EU directive. We're supposed to now understand the, the gross national happiness of, of various countries and, and where everybody fits. But it's still really mocked, isn't it, in some quarters? It's not, re you know, it's not really kind of you know, been sustained as a, as a good idea. We know there's been a decoupling of life satisfaction from purchasing power, of course, you know, beyond, you know, there is a point at which you need that purchasing power. But we also know that it levels off, you know. There's only so much you need in order to be happy. Um, which brings me to good idea number five, um, which is, um, in my opinion, I don't think it's a number of cars which are the problem. I don't even think it's a number of goods that are the problem. I don't even think it's the number of babies that are the problem. I actually think the problem is the primary resource that we use, those babies or those products or those cars use, and the waste that we make. Because we know that 
that one Indian baby isn't the same as an American baby. We know that one Indian baby isn't the same as another Indian baby. We know an American, we know that. It's actually about how we complete that circle um, so that actually we can attempt to start moving back towards the limits, which I actually think as an engineer and as a designer is brilliant because it means there are limits to growth, but there are no limits to development. And somebody else said it earlier today. It's within our capacity to actually take these ideas, our creative capacity, and to really do something with them. Again, it's not something we're ever taught. Um, very quickly, uh, Stockholm Conference 72, 117 nations got together, talk about things that, they, you know, the effects of pollution, if everybody was to replicate the then current models of development, if we got China, God forbid, behaving like America, if we got Brazil and India actually developing um, in the ways, in those same ways. Um, of course, the developing countries thought that was moralizing. They thought it was a restraint on, on development to actually consider that there should be another form of development. The really interesting thing is that when everybody left that conference, everybody had actually agree agreed that it was pragmatic and it was in everybody's self-interest to look at different forms of development from the then current Western polluting model. Idea number six, only one Earth, um, by Barbara Ward. Um, this good idea hasn't fared very well either, have you noticed? Um, these are the top ten countries in terms of their ecological footprint. Um, and we know we're living beyond our means. Um, so the idea has not completely thrived either. Um, my next slide is to give it up for Rachel Carson. Um, my next superhero, an American marine biologist, if you don't know about her, please do. Uh, her book, Silent Spring, um, probably had more influence um, on environmentalism than, than any other publication. Um, and there was nobody more influential in, in my education, that's for sure. So she, was, she did talk about man, forgive her that. Um, when Rachel Carson was talking about the war on nature, she wasn't actually talking about giant pandas. She was, what she was doing was she was looking down her microscope, actually, at what was happening within the field of microorganisms. Um, that's Silent Spring. You see, I heard that bees were dying about 40 years ago. And every so often, you kind of get reminded by somebody you know, new to the scene, who decides to write about the fact that, that bees are dying, um, which again would suggest that the idea hasn't particularly thrived. Within the built environment, um, we can have this, archetypes development in, in Stroud, um, but actually we tend more to get this, don't we? Um, we could have this, um, but again, we tend to get this. That's a schoolyard, very inspiring. This is a schoolyard in Germany with an inbuilt SUD scheme. You couldn't do that in the UK because children would drown running away from the paedophiles. <laughs> Thank you. I'm here all week. Um, Barry Commoner. Uh, now, actually, Howard introduced me to Barry Commoner. I'd never heard of him. Um, he stood uh, for president of the US in the early 80s on the four basic tenets, unbending laws of ecology. That's what he called them, the unbending laws of ecology. Um, everything must go somewhere. Fabulous. And he wrote a book called The Closing Circle. Uh, again, I commend to you. You can get it for 10 pence on, um, from the States if you pay for postage. There's lots of them about. Um, and when he was talking about everything must go somewhere, well, let's assume that he was talking about the paint on those walls and the air freshener uh, in that room going into the lungs of the children in that school, because it is going somewhere. He probably um, foresaw the oceanic plastic soup, actually. He probably saw that one coming. Um, it's taken from a wonderful book called Cause and Effect, which I recommend to you as well. Um, this, if you don't know, is actually bits of plastic taken from, from the uh, bodies of digestive tracts of albatross chicks. Lovely. 
And we do know that the number of building materials and the number of toxic building materials has expanded enormously um, over, over my professional lifetime. And having just seen the waste house, I think it's worth remembering that actually we're kind of encouraged to do this, take other people's waste and make it into building products. And I personally think we should just be dumping this all back on the doorsteps of the people who made it in the first place and telling them to design their tyres and their cans better. It's just a little thing I have about it. This is dealt with suspicion. This is just natural timber, totally untreated, designed to be long-lasting because it's designed well. But it's treated with enormous amount of, of suspicion um, by, by lots of people. Somehow you've got to paint it with copper, chrome and arsenic um, for it to be okay, at which point, of course, it's a toxic waste. So we're transferring the liability to the future through all sorts of stuff that we make when actually we know, and I work as a consultant, I work as an advisor, there's always an alternative, and there is always an alternative that will go to earth. If it must go somewhere, that's where you want it to go. Um, this is a development in Tübingen in Germany where they actually kept hold of the land. They didn't sell it on to a developer and they put in place a, a design quality framework um, which meant that a lot, non a lot of polluting things couldn't be used. And believe it or not, they just built a whole town on it. It didn't stop them building. They just got on and did it. Um, oh, yes, right, okay. A, li a little nod on, on climate change. This is the prediction... Um, currently about for 2030. This is an extract from my Building Biology in Colour, volume um, five, um, kind of the same kind of numbers uh, that I read when I was 11. Um, and there was nothing to suggest at that time when I read that this climate change stuff. I was a budding little engineer, budding little chemist, budding little physicist. There was nothing to suggest that it wasn't true. So I don't know where, where everybody else was in all of this. Um, if I could be a, uh, um, a superhero for a day, um, I would probably scream bullshit very loudly uh, any time anybody talked about energy generation. Um, everybody talks about megawatts. Nobody, but nobody talks about megawatts. Please, can we just really seriously get on with turning just one in 15 lights out? It'd be good. It'd be a good start. That's a rather nice little experiment that we're undertaking. Um, this is Elvis. I don't know what geek boy is called, but the, the hamster's called Elvis, who's charging, charging phones. This is a kind of adult experiment where we're spending 25 grand to light some light bulbs during the day. Um, and this is another adult experiment um, where we've got uh, 16 square meters of solar panels on that roof uh, facing east. Uh, and it's there to educate children in how stupid teachers are. Um, there's loads of it. It's just pants. We know, you know, renewables are not going to solve the problem. They're great to have, but they're not going to solve the problem. We do know that we can actually contribute a significant amount of, of conservation. Just, you know, turning it down, fixing the thermostat, you know, switching the lights off, pointing development south, putting in, in the insulation. And the reason the passive stuff is good brings me to good idea number nine. Which is why I'm not the best loved building services engineer in the world. Um, this, you're supposed to be flogging kit, not telling people not to use it. Yeah. Um, and then we have this small problem of, of claims. Um, what is and what isn't green. Um, this is apparently, this is a wonderful world's first green skyscraper. Um, it's, uh, it's got windows that open right up to the 32nd floor, apparently, and it uses natural ventilation through opening windows for up to 40% of the year. Um, can, we just, can we just assume that this is, is just, please, can we just stop it now? Can we just tell them? Can we just shout it really loud? Uh, I'm going to come to number 10, which is Richard Feynman. You can't lie to God in your sleep. You know, nature will actually find you out. And I think we have to call people out before the natural environment finds us all out. Which brings me to Ian McHarg, who was a pioneer uh, in the concept of ecological planning. He's a Scotsman. He wrote a wonderful book called Design with Nature. 
uh, looking at modern development and presenting ways of resolving uh, a lot of dilemmas, a lot of issues around suds and, and water management um, and planting and coastal zone management come from, come from McHarg. Who also said that good environmental design is good economics. He'd have loved something like the Emscher Park development, 17 towns across northern Germany, designed from the landscape up, uh, so a hedgehog could walk from one end to the other, about the equivalent of going from Hull to Manchester, um, without actually having to cross a road. And, and there is some lovely, lovely development in places like Malmo and Berlin, where they've actually got, they've got guidelines now for the percentage of biodiverse, rich, blue and greenscape that you need in your development. They're actually making places that people want to live and where the natural environment can live and where we can actually support biodiversity, which it's our responsibility to do. Unfortunately, there's also a lot of this, um, which is just to show that there's nowhere so beautiful that, that the construction industry can't make a mess of it. So uh, Ian McHarg also said that my, man is a blind, witless, lowbrow, anthropocentric clod who inflicts lesions upon the earth. <laughs> which, to be fair, is common language in the Scottish pub. Um, but there you go. Um, this is the kind of project that most people think I get involved in when I say I'm involved in ecological design. I love it. Uh, it's a self-built project by, bunch, uh, built by a bunch of kids in Germany. Um, they use it, they love it, they haven't burnt it down yet. It's fabulous. Uh, which brings me to my final, um, Sherry Arnstein, who's remembered for her pioneering work on the ladder of participation. Each increasing rung is actually a more engaged level of participation. I'd love to have time to talk you through it because it's just a lovely piece of work. She's also the only person I don't actually have a picture of. Um, we try to do it, we consult. Um, I've already said community-led development actually solves real needs, um, whereas developer-led development just makes money for developers. And we try to consult with lots of people. This is a lovely project in Germany where the kids were actually really actively involved in designing their own schools. Um, we also work with, with kids in a variety of places, getting the children to determine their needs at a, at a city scale. Um, and they're brilliant. Look at that. Planner in the making. They might be stupid now, but they needn't be. Um, they're good. You know, they're actually designing for real needs. Um, I tried to do this with a bunch of, of architects in universities and they're rubbish. They can't, they can't get it at all. So what I've actually described um, is not so much a short history of, of good ideas, but I think it's more of a, a long history of missed opportunities. Um, for some reason, when we're presented with really good ideas, um, they, seem, they seem to kind of, the, the A-class ideas seem to get shoved out of the way by B-class thinking. And... I'm not quite sure that I understand why. What I do understand is that the vast majority of my good ideas were not things that I was ever taught. They are things that I've had to learn and identify and use as the basis of all of my professional work. These are the things that underpin what I do. Um, and I didn't go into engineering in order to be countercultural on, on the margins. That just seems to be because I choose these as being really important to me. Counterculture is kind of alive and well. There's some good stuff happening. There is. Um, but I wonder where we actually are. Where were we when Rachel Carson was talking about pesticides? Where were we when Barry, Com Barry Commoner was talking about everything must go somewhere? Listen to it. It's a fact. Where, what's happened to this body of facts such that actually most people don't get to hear about them. Um, I'm developing this much further into a book coming soon, Ecomax. Thank you for your attention.